This is Free to Exchange, the show where free thinking scholars, free markets, and ironically, free public television all meet. I'm your host, Ben Powell. On today's show, we're going to talk about health care. The Affordable Care Act, aka Obamacare, has been one of the more controversial public policies in recent years. In the first half of the show, we're going to discuss the economics of Obamacare. The Affordable Care Act and other governmental interventions in the healthcare industry are supposedly necessary because free markets would fail to provide adequate health care. In the second half of the show, we'll discuss how market forces might be able to better provide health care. Joining me to discuss these issues today is Dr. Robert Lawson and Dr. Gilbert Burdine. Dr. Lawson is the Jerome Fullenweiner Endowed Chair in Economic Freedom at Southern Methodist University. Dr. Burdine is a practicing physician and associate professor of medicine at Texas Tech University's Health Science Center. That means he's a real doctor, not purely an academic like Lawson and I. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. In fact, actually, welcome back because you've both been guests before and, and were great, so I'm, I'm thrilled to have you here to talk about this. So let's start by Bob, maybe. Uh, if you could give us what's the kind of basic economics going on behind Obamacare? Well, you know, when the rollout of Obamacare happened, I mean, most of the media was captivated by the, uh, the glitches in the website. And right there, you know, we should always wonder, like, you know, if they can't run a proper website, how are they going to run our health care? But <laughs> leaving that aside, I mean, at the end of the day, the biggest issue was the, the sort of sticker shock when many people, particularly in the individual market, they went to the health care exchanges at the state or federal level and they looked at the, the bill and, you know, they were shocked. It was $800 a month last year and their normal plan that they bought from some private vendor, private health insurer. And now it's double that or triple that in some cases. It was, and people went on and it, it was very sad, actually, people who supported the uh, Affordable Care Act were going on, well, wow, I didn't know it was going to be this expensive. But, you know, to an economist, it, none of this should have been a surprise. I mean, this was not a, a, at all a surprise. I think, I think of these things in supply and demand terms, because I'm an economist. Supply and demand, <laughs> Absolutely. right? Absolutely. And on the one hand, Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act, it stimulates demand. It, it literally forces people to buy this product, health insurance, many of whom didn't buy it before. So you, you stimulate demand by making people buy the product. And also, if they can't afford it, they subsidize that, that purchase. And that's the demand side. So we're pushing more buyers into the market. But what are we doing on the seller side? Well, of course, side? some people would say pushing more buyers into the market is what we wanted to do, well, right? Of course. I mean, that is the design. Right. And my, that's actually my point. Is this is actually the design of the programs. We're pushing buyers into the market. But what are we doing on the seller side, on the, on the health insurer side, is we're, we're layering more and more mandates onto the programs. In fact, many people, the reason they were getting more expensive plans was because their old low frills, relatively inexpensive plan was now illegal. And the government says, no, that health care plan you were happy with last year is no longer legal. You need one that has you know, birth control pills and, and a whole array of other services that they may not have really been willing or wanting to pay for. I remember hearing at the time, in fact, we can let the president say it. I mean, this is what o Obama said. No matter what you've heard, if you like your doctor or health care plan, you can keep it. So was the president lying to us? Well, I don't know what he knew at the time or what he was thinking, but it was clearly impossible to offer more health care at less cost. Uh, there's no way you can do this. If you're going to have more people covered, it's going to cost more money. Now, a lot of people were claiming that, uh, oh, well, by providing access to uh, maintenance, health maintenance, and annual checkups, that now people will avoid the emergency room for more expensive treatment, so it will actually cost less money. But they're not creating any more physicians to see people in the office. They're not creating any more nurses to see people in the that office. They act in it spontaneously create more of you? Right. And, and so there's nobody to, to do all these office visits and all of this health maintenance. So giving more people access to the same amount of health maintenance, annual checkups, just means longer lines. And what you'll see is people who used to go into the doctor's office will now find that the office is full, they can't get an appointment for four weeks or six weeks, they end up in the emergency room. So it's a switching of who's using the emergency room, not a net right. decrease. Right. So this is on the, the, the demand side of more people being pushed in and then pushed around, actually, which is, I think, a point a lot of people miss. Um, let's talk more about the supply side, then, of, of the market. You were talking about more of these individual, uh, more of these mandated coverages. So is that what's driving up the, the cost from well, your perspective, the, too? The elimination of pre-existing conditions is a big factor. Uh, a, the insurance business is pooled risk. 
uh, if, you, if you don't have a condition, you have a risk of getting it, but it's, a, it's an uncertainty, it's a risk. And so people can pool their uncertainty together. So an example would be acute myelogenous leukemia, or AML, deadly disease, costs over $100,000 a year to treat, but it's very rare. So if 4% of the pop, or four people per 100,000 get this disease and it costs $100,000 to treat in a year, so for about $4 a year, you can cover the whole population against AML. But if somebody has AML, well, you can't sell him a policy for $4 to treat him because his cost is certainly going to be $100,000. Yeah, I mean, I would like to buy my car insurance after I have an accident right. every time. Or, you know, selling life insurance to a corpse or that's... selling fire insurance after the house is already burned down. But that's essentially, I mean, Bob, that's essentially what this mandate is doing, right? Well, yeah, and relatedly, of course, is it's not just uh, health insurance for these extremely rare but, but serious diseases and, and ailments. It's it's coverage for routine things. So um, everybody needs a checkup every so often. Everybody, uh, not everybody, but very frequently people break their arms. I mean, these are fairly routine, but not terribly expensive, but they're routine. It happens to almost every one of us in our families every year, every few years. These and don't sound like insurable events. They're not really insurable events, but really what our health insurance programs have become is one massive prepayment program where we, we put a bunch of money into a pot and then we draw it out when we, when we break our arm or we get the sniffles or, or whatever. But that's a terribly inefficient way to, to pay for, for these kind of routine events. It's very expensive. There's, there's, at the very least, there's the administrative cost of running an insurance program to pay for all the, and all the paperwork associated with running insurance um, that is associated with these, again, mundane, routine, root, uh, type, type checkups and, and fairly you know, normal uh, medical events. Yeah, low cost plans, uh, the, the plans that people associated with low cost insurance in previous years, they're generally hospital only plans. They cover uh, unforeseen catastrophic events uh, that are not likely to happen, but they don't cover office visits, blood pressure checks, routine medications. These are not insurable conditions. These are things you know are going to happen, and you're simply providing a subsidy for poor health. Let me, right. I, I don't. Insure, I insure my house against being burnt down or a tornado strike, but I can't insure the lawn mowing and you know painting right. and cleaning of the house. Well, I was going to use that exact that exact comparison. I mean, it would be insane to buy a light bulb insurance policy for the light bulbs that burn out of my house. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could do that. I imagine somebody if you you know could sell a, a policy that says, well, if your light bulb goes out, we'll provide a new one for free. But that, that's a silly policy to buy. No rational homeowner is going to buy that policy because the cost of the program, the cost of the policy will exceed just going down to Home Depot and buying a new, new light bulb when it breaks. Sure. Of course, now that we have the new government mandated light standards, they're, they're never going to go out, right? <laughs> right. Um, so tell me, uh, both of you, or maybe start with Bob, where, with what's ha happened with Obamacare, where is it all going? Well, here's my worry. Right now, uh, when you stimulate demand and you restrict supply, that's a recipe in economics for prices going up, and that's what these, these people who got these, these bills faced. But at the end of the day, there's going to be a pushback against that. And my worry is that we're going to follow that up, and I think we're already. There are elements of price controls built into Obamacare now, but we're going to see more and more price controls. So in an environment when demand goes out, supply goes in, prices don't go up, that's an environment for shortages, waiting lines, and it's the kind of thing that we see when, when you think of Canadian health care. Or England, it's, it's, uh, that's what you get in England, people waiting months to have a uh, hip replacement done. Um, the idea, you know, a certain number of people die waiting. Literally die while waiting for the procedures. And we right. see this in Canada too. I mean, I hear stories of people getting their dog x-rayed who can't get an x-ray for themselves. Right, well, in Canada, a lot of the people near, live near the border. So people who have real emergent uh, things will just come to the United States and get it done there because you can pretty much get what you want done right away um, if you're willing to pay for it. That sounds like a market actually. Right. Um, so what I've heard from both of you throughout this though is that you know people want to focus on you know the, the website not working and these other problems. These are all just kind of stuff in the background but the thing we're seeing with prices and waiting lines and stuff this isn't like an act well it might not have been intentional but if you understood the economics behind it this is like a necessary outcome that should have been predicted by reasonable economists. It was predicted by reasonable economists. Yeah, I, I, these are features, not bugs of the program. And um, you know, I think 
the other big scandal in healthcare was the Veterans Administration uh, scandal and delays there. And I think that's where you asked where Obamacare is going. Obamacare, our healthcare system driven by Obamacare is going the way of the VA. And the scandal there, people were shocked, again, to see that the VA administrators are delaying care, making people wait, and, and during these waiting periods, people people literally die. This is what some people have called the, the VA death panel, basically, because the people are choosing who's going to get care when, mm -hmm. and people are dying in the wait. And that exactly is the inevitable and predictable consequence of these kinds of policies. Well, hopefully we won't go too far in that direction, and maybe we need to talk about other ideas and alternatives, and that's what we'll do in the second part of the show. So up next, more from Dr. Lawson and Dr. Burdine on how a free market in healthcare might be able to better provide medical service. We'll be right back. Free to Exchange is a joint project of Texas Tech's Free Market Institute and Texas Tech Public Media. More information is available at fmi.ttu.edu. When humans and nature get together, wild things happen. See the bold, crazy ideas that are bringing the wild back to life. I cannot believe what I'm seeing. An original series where together, people and nature thrive. It leaves you with just this enormous sense of endless possibility. Earth, a new wild. Welcome back. Still with me is economist Robert Lawson and medical doctor Gilbert Burdine. So the Obamacare Act wasn't passed in a vacuum. I think people correctly thought healthcare markets were pretty messed up before that and a lot of people were unsatisfied. So they tended to blame the, the, the free market. They said the market's failing in healthcare, people aren't getting insurance, we need to do something, that something is Obamacare. Is this story even plausible? Well, I mean, healthcare industry is probably the most regulated industry in the United States, maybe second to finance. And so it is a bit disingenuous to say that, you know, the market is failing in this industry, which is layered and layered with, with massive government regulations. Not for nothing, the finance industry had a little hiccup and there, too. The, huh? And not, not coincidentally, in my opinion. So, yeah, indeed. I mean, every, every state regulates uh, the provision of health care, what nurses can do, what nurse practitioners can do, what doctors can do, how many beds you can have in a hospital, who can become a doctor. Every aspect of the health care uh, process is heavily regulated by by bureaucrats in Austin or in Washington, D.C. So, Gilbert, tell me a little bit. I mean, you've been a practicing physician for 30 years now, roughly. Right. Uh, how has it changed? What procedures could you do before that have become uneconomical because of government regulations? Or, or is this just market forces? No. When I was a medical student, uh, there's a procedure called thoracentesis. And uh, with some diseases, you accumulate fluid around the lung. Okay. And the fluid accumulation makes it hard to breathe, so the fluid has to be drained. And the drainage is called thoracentesis. You basically put a needle into the chest and drain the fluid off. When I was a student, this was a third-year medical student procedure. All third-year medical students would learn how to do it. I did at least a dozen in three months uh, on my internal medicine rotation. Uh, when I went into private practice in 1989, I said, well, I'm just going to keep doing what I did as a student. And I tried to do it, and I found that the cost of the equipment tray exceeded what I would get reimbursed for doing the procedure. So I could not do... Reimbursed could, by who? Uh, Medicare. Medicare, okay. So I could not do the procedure in the office at a low cost and increased convenience to the patient. So the people who needed it, well, I had to... Wait a second. Well, why couldn't you? What happened? Did the prices get too high? Did the prices get the, the regulated or what? The reimbursement for the procedure has declined over time. Uh, that was one of the big ticket items. Uh, many procedures, the reimbursement was cut. But also the price of the trays is going up due to price inflation, but that's probably another segment of your show. The price caps are right. within the Medicaid system telling you what you can... Right. You, you can't charge more than that. And you, it, with this procedure, you basically got to a point where it was more expensive for you to do the procedure than you would get paid for doing so it. Did you just let your patients have a bunch of fluid around their lungs and die? No. Um, uh, 
we're very creative, and That's so uh, there's a way you can get around it with price controls. You can bundle services. And the most common bundle would be to send the patient to the emergency room, and you could do the procedure in the emergency room. Now, you would, some, you would get your small fee, uh, and it was probably a money loser for you. Uh, the hospital was happy because they would charge $500, $1,000 uh, emergency room fee to what would have normally been a one or $200 procedure. Uh, so this is what was going on in 1989. Then by the time you get to 2000, medical students no longer get trained to do this procedure because internists no longer want to do it because they don't get paid enough to do it. So it has now become the province of the subspecialists. So now radiologists get special training on how to do something that a third year medical student was expected to know. Mm. They attach a CAT scan to the procedure. So Why? they, well, you can't, you still can't do the procedure economically, so you have to attach something to it to make it viable to have it done. <laughs> so now you get a $1,000 or $2,000 CAT scan charge. Uh, with your thoracentesis, and the person doing it probably doesn't have the same expertise that the people who were doing it since they were third year medical students uh, acquire. Now in 2014, it's even worse. Now you don't even uh, go in and have the radiologist do the CAT scan and do the procedure. You're admitted to the hospital. You stay, you spend a day in the hospital, which can cost $10,000 a day. You get your CAT scan, which is another one or $2,000, and you get your thoracentesis, which should be doable even at today's prices for one to $200. <sighs> You know, having you on is depressing sometimes, even though you're a cheery guy. Um, so when we looked at, so the, the bottom line here is that these increased healthcare costs that made insurance or healthcare unaffordable to people weren't the product of like market forces of just normal prices going up. It's, there were price controls and doctors respond rationally to it, but they bundle this other stuff in and the next thing you know, emergency rooms, hospital beds, all these things are becoming more scarce because there's essentially artificial demand for them. Well, it's, these are all government failures. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, people will do the expensive thing. Sometimes uh, the government steers what we do by changing the reimbursement rates. Um, you know, Paul Krugman has said, well, uh, coronary all the big bucks are in coronary bypass. Well, who made the big bucks in coronary bypass? You know, why do they get reimbursed the amount they do? And uh, health maintenance is reimbursed so lowly. So um, these are all government decisions. These are not market decisions. Which are subject to lobby. Go ahead. Well, lobby. one of the biggest health one of the biggest government decisions was to make our health care expenditures tax deductible when it's run through our through our employer health care plans. Right. And I don't know about you, Ben, but I have never gone to a car car mechanic and had a car you know brake job or, or something needed to be done and. The mechanic says, I'll just fix it. And I go, okay, just fix it. I've always, every time I've asked him, how much is that going to cost? Mm -hmm. In my entire life, I've never asked a doctor how much it's going to cost. Never once. And the reason is, even if I asked, partly the doctor wouldn't know the answer, the which doctor, is very bizarre. The doctor wouldn't right? know Neither the, the buyer nor the seller knows how much this is going to cost. This is a recipe. I don't see many market for, transactions where that's the case. Precisely. So when you say free market in healthcare, I'm like, there's not even a market. Because in a market, you need buyers and sellers, and they actually need to have some sense of what the price is. And that's not the world we live in. That, in fact, is driven by, by the health insurance systems that we have, which are driven by the tax law, which encouraged us to to pay for our health care with, with insurance. Which is insane because one of the reasons why there were so many uninsured people is they were just between employers. Exactly. And of course you could develop one of the conditions while you were already insured right. but then go between employers and then be uninsurable after that. Right. The solution for those kinds of things where people want long-term insurance would be long-term policies. But in an environment where Congress changes the rules every two years, nobody in their right mind is going to write long-term policies. Right. Okay, so let's look ahead. So if these shortages continue to get worse under Obamacare going forward, how could we reform and have a freer market here? Or how could American citizens make use of freer markets in order to get their health care? The biggest innovation that we thought we were going to get was a growing law, uh, high deductible, very affordable health care plan so people could afford to cover themselves or be, be covered in the event of a serious type medical event like cancer or some you know major heart attack or something like that something that's going to cost hundreds or millions you know, hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars 
uh, those plans are actually pretty affordable. Um, the, the, what, what makes them unaffordable, what makes our health care plans right now so unaffordable, and our health care system so unaffordable, is that we're paying for, you know, our annual checkups and so on. We thought we were going to be getting more of those kinds of high deductible plans that would be affordable, and then people would be out of pocketing their routine expense, just like we're out of pocket for our routine grocery bill every every week we go to the grocery store and so on. And that's what markets, that's how markets would work, is we're gonna be pay for, pay for out of pocket for routine expenses, we'll buy insurance for rare but, it, but catastrophic expense, potential okay. expenses. Unfortunately, under Obamacare, uh, a lot of those plans are now illegal. And there's a lot of pressure in, in the, from the regulators to put those plans, in, to, to, to force us into these extremely expensive and inefficient plans where, again, we don't ask each other, we don't even ask what the price is. So what would a free market in medical care look like? Well, I think the key is, as he mentioned, you first have to separate out health maintenance and pay for health maintenance out of pocket, and, and that's separated from uh, health insurance or insur insurable conditions. So that's the first thing that has to happen. They also have to get rid of all the regulations which interfere with the supply of health care. Uh, there are just so many rules. In private practice now, you literally have to hire someone to watch you do what you do for a day to tell you how many laws you've broken uh, because there's no way to know. Uh, it's, it's just impossible to follow all the rules and this makes things very expensive. But wouldn't some people say these rules make us safer? No, they don't make us safer. They give people the illusion that they're being protected but you know, things still happen. I, I have a lot of people, when I say we, we got to get rid of licensure, for example, they say, well, you'll have quacks. Well, we still have quacks, but they're licensed quacks. Uh, and that's, that's all, all you change. Uh, there are market mechanisms for um, reviewing quality of care. Uh, there, there, are ways to rate, yeah, there are ways to rate things. People can give ratings. It's just you can't deprive someone of the ability to uh, pursue their livelihood by saying, you know, you didn't like what they did this day. Sure. And there's plenty of things, right, that, you know, nurse practitioners or somebody else could do that you have to go see physicians for if they just got narrow right. training to do simple right. procedure stuff. My right? thoracentesis example, you do not need four years of medical school uh, and three years of postgraduate training to learn how to do a thoracentesis. Uh, we, we need to have a system where the, the large volume required things are supplied by people who have the necessary training, but not more than necessary training. Um, uh, the, you know, the doctors are a cartel. We are protecting our turf. We want everything to go through us. We want control over everything. And this is a big part of the problem. And th this is what needs to be gotten rid of. Um, you know, you talk about what happens. He was saying, well, what happens when you combine the supply-demand uh, dynamics that are in place? Well, you end up with shortages. And that's the big question going forward. Will the government have a heavy hand? In which, and if they become more authoritarian, you're going to have some real serious trouble getting any health care. Uh, if the government permits a so-called black market to develop in the delivery of health care, then things will probably work out okay. And you're already seeing this in selected markets. You see physicians operating a, on a, a black market. You don't mean something shady here. You just mean people voluntarily providing medical care for fee that aren't necessarily in the official system. Right. Well, it's cash for service. Um, and it's very similar to the practice in India. You know, in India, you see a doctor, you spend five or 10 minutes telling him about your problems, he tells you what to do and it costs you $10. And uh, you could have these kinds of operations in you know, Walmart. Yeah, um, actually, we see medical tourism today, right, in response we, to this. That's one of the responses to our system is uh, it, it turns out it's cheaper to go to India, uh, spend a week in a four-star hotel and get your calf heart cath than it is to have a heart cath uh, here in the United States. So people are now, are now doing this. So if, they, if the government does not take a heavy hand and allows the market to work, to function, then uh, there will be some hope. Well, I uh, remain hopeful that that will be the outcome. And thank you both for coming and discussing these ideas with us today. Thank you. If I asked you to imagine a market where the buyers don't actually pay the money for the service. The sellers who actually provide it don't know the cost of it, and for that matter, the buyers don't know it either. The government regulates how many people can supply it and how they can supply it. 
and the buyers lose their payment mechanism when they move between jobs, I bet you'd imagine a pretty messed up market. Well, we don't have to imagine it. That's the reality of American healthcare markets. There was no free market failure that necessitated Obamacare. It's government failure over a period of 30 years that has made our healthcare markets more and more messed up. I hope our discussion between our guests today sheds some light on that for everybody. And I certainly hope we look to make more market mechanisms work in healthcare in the future. I'll see you next time.